Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this latest episode of Hacker Toolbox, where I explain kind of the briefest like information about how to use some of the most popular tools in bug bounties. Now, this week, for once, I am ahead of the curve, I am on the ball, I'm ready. Um, we're talking about Kite Runner. Now, Kite Runner was a tool that was literally like just released, um, I think last week, at B Sides Canberra uh, by the Asset Note team. And if you don't know what Asset Note is, it's a company that's kind of started by a lot of bug bounty hunters and they kind of do like scanning tools. But what I think are really good and what they've done kind of recently is actually they release a lot of API hacking tools. And this is what Kite Runner is. So Kite Runner is a really, 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 and I mean, I've, I've tested it, good API hacking tool. Um, and it's great for doing API recon and I wanna talk about it. But before we get on with the rest of the video, you know we've got to thank our sponsor. This video is very kindly sponsored by Integrity. Integrity is a really fast growing bug bounty platform. So they have like the targets, they allow you to report the bugs and they're the ones that kind of pay out and deal with that side of things. Because they're growing so fast, they have a lot of opportunities. Like there's new programs to hack, there's always scope changes, like there's so many fresh things to hack on. And that's not just in their private programs, but also in their public programs too. I really love working with them because they're actually really big support of the bug bounty community. They sponsor not just my content, but other creators as well. Um, and I know a lot of people have already signed up and some of you have even found your first bug or participated in the XSS challenges that they run. And I'm really happy for you all. Um, if you want to join them and sign up, you can use my link on screen. So that's go.integrity.com forward slash Katie. Um, it's also in the video description. That's go.integrity.com forward slash Katie. So let's talk about Kite Runner. So here's my kind of in a nutshell slide. So what is Kite Runner? Well, it's a brute forcing slash fuzzing tool specifically about APIs. And what kind of makes it different is that it uses background info on how an API was built, like the technology behind it. Um, kind of standard, you give it a, lit, a URL or a list of URLs or a list of hosts and it will attempt to find endpoints. Um, in terms of output, you can output to JSON that has a kind of pretty print, or you can just do plain text. And what really makes it good is this kind of contextual awareness for API scanning. It can find API routes that no other tool can. And I mean that because I've tested it. Um, on my generic university, which you've probably all seen a demo of by now, um, kind of fake API that I use for demos, a lot of the normal tools won't pick up some of the API endpoints because they're very, like, uh, they're custom, they're domain specific, but Kite Runner can. Um, in terms of what it's lacking and what I think is kind of a disadvantage of using it is that it's quite difficult to get to interact with other tools. Um, you'll kind of see in when I talk about Burp kind of how this is difficult. Um, and some API fingerprints are missing. It's got a lot. <laughs> Don't get me wrong here. It's got a lot. Some are missing though. In terms of what it replaces, Burp Intruder, um, Dir search, FFUF kind of, quite a lot of it is related to word lists. You can kind of think of this as like a big brain word list. And the creators are Asset Note. Now there's not just one creator, the team worked on it um, and they made this whole blog post. And I really recommend reading that blog post, by the way, if you'd like to learn more. So really, why do we actually use these kind of tools? So any kind of brute forcing, what we're trying to do is do content discovery. We're trying to find new things to hack, things like new parameters, new endpoints, new subdomains. But actually today we're talking about API hacking. Now, what makes APIs particularly difficult to hack and why I think APIs are some of my favorite things to hack is that we don't actually know every API endpoint. It's quite difficult to predict API endpoints. So you just can't hack them as easily. Um, they're not as predictable as subdomains, but one advantage they do have is that they're very structured. Um, so there's very much a kind of standard structure you expect APIs to look like, which does help. Now, there are a lot of different bugs who use this kind of like brute forcing as a first step. Information disclosure, mass assignment, IDORs, all great things to look for in terms of like what you can do with this output. So what makes Kite Run special? I've made a few videos on API kind of enumeration. So why is this better than everything else I've talked about? Well, quite a lot of those other tools were just designed to go fast. 
They're, things like FFUF weren't designed with APIs in mind. They were just designed to go fast. And that's fine because that's not what they're there for. The idea is you provide a word list and you tell it what to look for and it will do it very quickly. Now, what makes Kite Runner special is because it was designed for APIs, it kind of has this contextual awareness around APIs. So when APIs are built in certain languages, they'll follow kind of certain structure. And by inferring something about the API structure, we can be more specific with our recon. Now, a really easy example here is like, you know, API usually are in a directory called slash API, but they can also be in slash API slash version one. If you're dealing with a RESTful API, you not only have a um, kind of post and a get method, but you might also have a put, you might have a delete. Um, you know, what about patch, for example? But let's talk about how you actually do this. I'm going to give you a quick web development lesson. So back in the olden times, each page on a website used to relate to an actual file that existed. As in, if you went to the kind of domain mywebsite.com forward slash something forward slash index.php, there'd be a folder called something and then a file called index.php. And this is just not true anymore. This is why quite a lot of like the content discovery tools you might use probably doesn't really work um, because these files don't exist. Now, instead, what we use is site called routing. Now, what routing does is tell the web server, hey, when somebody asks for this file, send them to this piece of code. So here's an example. You ask for mywebsite.com forward slash contact. Now, there will be a file called root, um, and in there it will just say, hey, here's the entire list of roots. Now, if we look at this, we can see that we're getting the root with the get method, and we've got contact. So that's where these two link up. If I just change my little thing to be a uh, pen. So that's where this part matches up with that. And then this part here, this kind of thing here goes to this. This next thing says, hey, this is the file and then this is the piece of code. And then the name doesn't really matter, it's just to make it easier. So which means that this one here controls the post request to dash vulnerability and then says, hey, that's the code to run, which means that essentially this get request up here that goes to vulnerability and this post request go to different pieces of code despite being the same endpoint. Now, what you kind of get down to down here is we have the page controller. So this is the class it's in. This first this first bit, page controller, is the class. And then this is the function. So contact, contact here. So the, in the same um, file here, page controller, there'll be something else that says vulnerability submit, vulnerability. And then in here is the code we actually run. So this is like in a completely different place. It's not called contact. The file's not called contact, it's not in a folder called contact, it just doesn't exist. And that's how modern web applications work. Now, different frameworks handle this in different ways. So this is an example in Laravel. Um, and Laravel has it built like this, but there's other ones as well. And you can kind of see some of the advantages here. For example, you can load in middleware. So what middleware is, is like the ability to authenticate, for example, to check you know, before somebody accesses an admin page, if they're an administrator. So it's got quite a lot of advantages. It makes writing the code a lot, a lot easier. But it's worth keeping in mind that this is not the same. And this is how APIs are built nowadays. Um, to add to that, some uh, frameworks will automatically generate API routes as well. Um, so here you can kind of see it in your action. So this one here, auth routes, what that is saying is hey, just put in all of the default authentication routes into this file. So you can kind of see that um, it kind of does quite a lot automatically. So this is why having this kind of contextual awareness is important. So let's talk about data sources. One of the most, the other key advantages of the Kite Runner is just the sheer number of data sources. So the asset note team, and you might have seen this, released a ton of these like existing word lists. They used BigQuery, they're looking at like web archive, they've got like looking at like Swagger, there's so many different um, API kind of data sources they're using. Um, so not only can you download these kind of files, so you see they've got .kite, which is designed for Kite Runner. There's also JSON there as well, and you can see there's just a regular .wordlist.txt. And there are so many of them. I'm not joking. 
There are even more. There's things like technology host mapping, manually generated word lists. Like, there's so many that they have. Um, and this is, like, on Kite Runner, you can use the uh, defaults here. You can use your own. Or you can, in fact, take these existing word lists and put them into other tools like FFUF if you are already got kind of a workflow going. So, to kind of summarise that in English, if you know that slash API users exist, don't look for any API endpoints under slash. Look instead under API. What, like, other files like favicon are not going to be under um, API. They're probably going to be in the root. Same with something like, you know, GraphQL. So here we can see, you know, we've got GraphQL here. We've got API users here. And this is kind of how the tool works, right? So we're using kind of understanding a little bit about how the tool works in order to do this. Right, so let's talk about installing Kite Runner. So Kite Runner is built on Go. Now Go is cross-platform, so you can do it on any operating system. However, there are some performance concerns and the creators have recommended Linux. Um, I'm going to explain to you how it can do it. You can use it in OS X and Windows. Um, and if you use Linux, there's also pre-compiled binaries. So really great if you use like a VPS already and it's part of your workflow, you can just put go in and kind of put it into your existing uh, recon. So um, if you don't use Homebrew, I really recommend it because then if you go on to um, uh, the command line on a Mac, you can do brew install go. And same thing for uh, Linux is sudo apt install golango. That installs go. Problem solved. Um, now, they also have the kind of visual um, one. I really prefer using brew. As not, you like, you all know me, I don't really like using the command line, but brew is so easy for like so many things, I end up using it. The next step is really to build the code. So you download the source code from GitHub. Now I'm recommending this over the pre-compiled binaries because it allows you to make changes. One of the best things about um, like learning to program is being able to make changes to this if you find it's not working for you. So I really recommend getting used to building from the source code and actually digging into it. Um, they've got instructions, follow the instructions. So this first one here, make build, that will actually create the binary, the runnable file. This one here, the sim link, that will actually move the um, binary that it creates and put it into user, loca uh, user local bin. And what that means is it just allows you to see it on your command line. So it doesn't matter, you don't need to go to that zip file, you can run it from anywhere. Um, this is, by the way, a very useful like thing to keep in mind whenever you use tools, is putting stuff in user local bin. Um, and this is the kind of using it in practice. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. So when it runs, um, this is what it will look like. This is how you know it's worked. It will download a bunch of um, uh, like Go, tool, go um, yeah, tools. Right. If you're on Windows, uh, you can get this to work on Windows. It's not designed to work on Windows because there are no instructions for Windows. However, should you want to try this out and you're on Windows, maybe you don't want to invest in a VPS or just want to try it out and see if it works for kind of the way you work. Download Go via the kind of visual install. Download Kite Runner. You then want to run this command. Don't worry, this is going to be in the description, which is go build o dist slash kr dot exe um, dot slash command Kite Runner. Then you want to CD into disk. So this is where your... Um, your Kite Runner executable is going to la land. So this is telling us where the code is. And this one is saying run from here. Then this creates the kind of initial scan. And as you can see, when you run the scan, it looks kind of messed up. Like it's definitely not designed to work on Windows. Um, the lovely pretty ASCII code has been replaced with blocks. And it looks super ugly. Um, so I wouldn't recommend using the pretty setting because like I say, it's it's pretty broken, but text or JSON will work. Um, but that's how you can get it working on Windows. And you can run a scan. Like it does work, you can run a scan if you just want to experiment with it, but maybe you're not, like you don't want to properly run scans. Really great play way to get started. Right, the step step three here is using a word list. So Kite Runner uses word lists in a very specific format called dot kite. You'll need to download these separately. So here are 
the compile.kite files. So you got roots large and roots small. Um, you can see here that roots large is much larger than roots small. You can also download the raw JSON, so that's useful if you're going to use it with another tool. But again, you're looking at much larger files here, like two gigabyte files. Um, if you want to use your own word list, you can see here, this is on the GitHub page, you can use the KB, uh, KRKB tool to convert them. So you can convert from text to kite, from kite to JSON, and from kite to text. So what you could do is you already have something happening, uh, like you already have a setup you like, you could go to um, rootslarge.kite here, you could download that, run this tool to turn it into a .text file and then use that with FFUF. Also, if you already have um, uh, like endpoints or, or sorry, a word list that you already like using, this is an also a great way to, um, to kind of transfer that over and use Kite Runner. Right, so that's how you install it. Let's talk about how you can actually use it. Um, so Kite Runner is still a new tool. If you've got problems with it, I highly recommend um, kind of speaking to people on GitHub because that's where they, they're being most active. Um, so if you do have problems, I probably can't provide you with support because I didn't make it. But these are the commands that did work for me when I tried it and I was experimenting with it. So first off is doing a generic scan. So to do a generic scan, you do KR for Kite Runner, then the scan keyword here, then the URL you want to uh, scan. Now it doesn't actually have to be a URL, it can be host, it can be a, a list. It's got quite a lot of options in the GitHub um, page. You can kind of see what they all are. Then you've got to do the slash W, so that's like the word list. And then you can provide it with the .kite file. So this is the large roots, there's also the small roots. Um, this is amazing. So this is the output. Um, I know this is super small, so you might want to just put this in HD so you can see it. Um, and this is the pretty printed version. So there's also the option for JSON and text by adding the O string. Um, but something I think is really cool about this is, you know, it's picked up users, which is pretty good. Um, it's also picked up roles, but it's got a 500 error. So that's probably something worth investigating. It's picked up quite a lot of 404s. Now, this is likely because it hasn't quite picked up the structure of Laravel. Um, because Laravel, this uh, app is in debug mode, so they might not have it set up for debug mode. Um, and as you can see, the bottom ones don't seem very relevant. Um, if I just make those a little bit larger there and clear the screen of all the uh, all the garbage. Uh, so here you can kind of see it in action. I mean, we've got in 404s and 405s. Like this is probably a valid um, endpoint to look into. This is probably not. Um, so this is something we might want to experiment with. But we'll talk about that in a bit. So not only can you do the scan, so the scan tool is specifically for APIs, you can also do a regular brute force. So think like scan APIs, brute is for brute forcing. Um, and this requires a plain word list, not a .kite or a .json file. So we can use this is um, this dash A here, which loads up the default asset note um, word lists. So you can put in your own word list here or you can use the default asset note ones. And like I say, asset notes have many, many, many uh, API and uh, API word lists. So this is one of them here, which is uh, 210228. And again, instead of scan, we replace with brute. And this is the um, URL we want to hit. You can change this. So if you want to do dash API, you can just add that to the end and it will recognize it. There is a ton more information on the GitHub page about how to actually do this because it's so target specific. And the output of that is very similar. So here we can see we're getting access to like a logon. We're actually getting a 302 redirect. We've got API users, we've got some irrelevant ones here, these 500s, 
but actually like we've got some good results with just using the kind of brute forcing tool here. All of those are valid endpoints uh, in my code. Now, I did say you can, you don't have to include a um, just one, you can do many. So here is some examples with more than one. Um, so you just put them one line after the other. So each target is a new line. And then instead we just save that as a source.txt. If you're wondering, it's in Nano, not Vim. Uh, I can't use Vim. So again, KR scan, then instead of kind of the like IP address or the um, uh, like HTTP or the domain or whatever, it is now source.txt and we can put whatever we want in here. Really useful for dealing with more than one target. It's also quicker um, and I'll explain how the kind of speeding up and speeding down goes. I'm sorry, speeding up and slowing down goes in a second, um, but it can also be quicker to kind of have some of these as, as more than one target. Now, what you might be thinking is, you know, the brute forcing kind of seemed kind of cool with the kind of default lists, and so did the, um, the kite, can I do both? And yes, you can. So you can do a dash W and you can do a dash A here and you can run you can scan for any of the um, asset note word lists. You just need to give it the name. Um, it is also possible to do the first 200 words or the first 100 words of these as well. So again, KR scan um, are our IP address, but in this case, this is actually like the URL we want to hit. Um, and then we've got downloads root cut large, the uh, large roots dot kite. Um, and we can just, you know, have these on. And the output of that is, you know, we're getting a lot more um, choices. We're actually getting quite a lot of noise. So WX app is not relevant. Product uh, tag type is not relevant. These ones exist. That one does not exist. This one exists. But here you can see we're actually hitting grades. Now grades is one of those domain specific endpoints I talked about before. So it's able to pick it up pretty well. Um, these ones are relevant, this one is not relevant, relevant, relevant. You can see here it's also picking up classes. It's got comments, but it is picking up classes. Customer vehicle is not relevant, this is not relevant, users is relevant, this isn't relevant. So you can kind of see we're picking up some noise as well because, you know, there's a lot. Um, and we'll talk about how to like filter that now. So that's the basic use case, right? But as you can see, it's very cool. It is very cool. <laughs> However, we might want to kind of um, interact this with other tools. We might want to, um, you know, filter them. There are some other things we need here. So let's go back to our original request here. Um, so we hit a lot of 404 errors here. Like what we might want to think from that is, you know, did we actually learn anything from those 404s? What's the outputting? What's the 405? What does that mean? What is the actual like request and response? Now for that, we've got KB, KR, KB replay. Now note this is KR and KB, then the word replay. So we wanna have both of these in there, right? Um, we then tell it what word list we used. So this is rootslarge.kite. And then we basically copy this whole line here. So we copy this whole thing all the way. So we have this like um, this, this code over here. So we want to copy from here all the way to the start. So we copy the entire line and put it into a string. You can see we've got quotation marks here and here. You want to copy the entire line and put it into a string. Now what this will do is replay a request. So it will show us here um, the um, raw reconstructed request, the outbound request it sent, and then the response after all the redirects. Um, so what are we actually learning from this? Well, we know the application is in debug mode. That could be a vulnerability itself. Um, we know that because we've got a ton of like these um, error messages here. It's not really telling us anything else about the API itself. Um, it when this is we know is like a false positive because it's not it's not doing anything useful. So we might be thinking from that, okay, let's filter out 404s. Now the other way to replay a request is using burp so, or any other proxy. It doesn't have to be burp. 
So first step is to find out what port and IP address the burp is listening on. So you do that, you go to proxy, then options. Then you want to just note what this is because we're going to need it. Then you go to proxy intercept there and then switch that off. Then when we do our command, we want to um, append dash dash proxy equals 127 and that is our burp thing there and that allows us to view the request in burp. So when we have a look at this, if I just clear uh, the, the pen here, we can see um, this is the same thing here as we saw in the raw one, it was just in burp. One advantage of doing this is that it will go like into burp scanner, you can repeat requests, you can change the parameters. Um, there's a lot of options you can do after doing this to just to check. Um, but let's talk about adding a filter. So we can use dash dash fail status codes and this will fail on one of these status codes. So for 400, 401, 404, 403, 501, 502, 426 and 411 are what we're going to filter on. These are the defaults it suggests, but I really recommend kind of running this experimenting with it what you actually need filtered um, because you don't want to miss something by default so and then if we filter the request here's what we've got so we're still picking up grades we're picking up users bulk update isn't necessarily relevant to us but this is and this is and so is this down there so what we've got from this is pretty nice i mean from this we might want to investigate this one and this one and kind of see what's happening from that you know why are they why are they 405s what's actually happening there etc and that's how you filter stuff so i want to talk quickly about formatting so um if we format this the first thing we can do is add this kind of dash o and we can use json pretty or text now um, pretty is the default so this is json so this top part of um, the JSON, this is actually like the header. So this tells us the uh, API that was used. This tells us the connection details. This tells us the target, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then if we tidy this up, you can kind of see this is the header here. So this gives us information about the scan, and this part here is then um, our uh, like. Uh, additional information. Now there is also um, dash Q, which will put it into quiet mode. And what dash Q means is that um, it won't output anything else. You could then save that into a file um, and use it and kind of evaluate it with additional tools. Same for plain text. So dash O, and you can see this is like a lot nicer. It's not got the colors, so it, it formats quite well. Um, Again, you can do dash Q, save it to a file. And if you're not sure how to do that on bash, you go like this, da, kind of little crocodile file dot text, and then it will save whatever the command is beforehand. And you pop that there. It will save whatever the command is beforehand into the file. So you can kind of think about it as push this into file dot text. Um, but that would allow you to kind of recall it. One cool thing you could do if you did want to um, look at this is run a scan, um, evaluate it, get like the results in this kind of format, and then repeat the requests with KB, um, uh, a re what was it, relay? Uh, replay, KB replay, um, and then replay every uh, what, like scan that worked. That could be an interesting thing if you uh, had some experience with scripting. Um, we also have slowing it down and speeding it up. So we have two settings. Um, we have max connections per host and max parallel hosts. Now, max parallel host is the number of hosts scanning at any one time. So think about that as like if you have two domains and that's set at two, it will do two domains at once. Now you then have max connections per host, which is the number of connections at once open on one host. So if you set that one to five and parallel host to two, it will have two um, hosts, so like two domains, and it will do five per domain. Now you can do some math to figure this out. However, it recommends 
um, the option of five and that will give between one and five requests per second between um, kind of 200 milliseconds and 1000 milliseconds per request given uh, to a single host. Um, it's also now an axiom so if you did want to kind of spread your scanning out over a large number of like um, VPSs you can totally do that. The default setting should be sufficient for my API on the large word list, it took about 15 minutes per scan, which is pretty good. Um, I found that was like totally okay. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really have any problems with it. I would expect if you are doing quite a large number of hosts, you may then want to consider scaling up to something like Axiom. Um, however, I will say like with recon, we don't just want to be hitting a website as fast as we possibly can. That's not actually going to give us good information. What we want to do is figure out what we want. So in this case, we want to scan for APIs. Okay. Um, with that in mind, is this host likely to have an API on it? If it's not, we don't have to worry about it. So with that, thank you very much for watching. I know this was kind of long for quite a short tool um but it's really so good i had to sort of talk about it i was experimenting with it just to see whether or not i did want to make a video and i was so impressed like i cannot tell you how impressed i was at this tool um this is going to completely change my api what like uh setup at the moment like it it's kind of it's 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 kind of amazing um, the fact that it was able to pick up domain specific word lists like that API was created to demonstrate that recon tools can be quite bad at APIs and it did it. So I was really impressed. I think the kind of contextual awareness is very impressive as well. Um, but we do have to, before we go, thank Integrity for sponsoring, uh, this video. Thank you again to Integrity for sponsoring my content. I really don't have it take having an advertiser lightly. And I genuinely, my honest opinion, I think they do amazing things for the community. It allows me to make serious investments into my channel. So that's included things like improving the audio, getting edit, access to proper editing tools. Um, and I really like that they interact with their community. They're always replying to hackers. They're always being helpful. Like they're so visible in what they do. Like it genuinely amazing. Um, so please from my community to theirs, give them a lot of love. You can sign off with my link on screen, go.integrity.com forward slash Katie. It's also in the video description if you don't want to type it. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for watching everybody. Um, I'm sorry that videos are being a bit sparse. I did absolutely intend to go back to making weekly videos. Um, I've had some health problems, so things are a bit weird at the moment. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to know more about that and see bad memes. Uh, and I've also, yeah, I've just started a job at Bug Crowd. Um, I'm actually working with the appeals team. So if you have a Bug Crowd appeal, you're probably going to get to me um, or somebody else on the team um, and we can help you out. So I now want to thank all of my Patreon supporters um, who have donated at the £10 per month tier. And those names are David, Bruna, Sean, Forrest, Patreon, Wardle Castles, Guyne Vale, Ram and James Clee. Thank you very much for those supporting me at the £10 a month tier if you'd like to join them. Uh, my Patreon will be linked in the description. You get a few benefits, um, access to my notes, access to videos early, access to the slides um, and a few other little pieces um, that you know, if you're interested, you can you can go sign up on Patreon. So hopefully uh, coming soon, I'll have a video on Postman and a video on note taking. Those are the next two videos. I'm sorry I'm being really slow. <laughs> I will promise like weekly videos will return as soon as I am well and I'm not extremely tired. So thank you very much for watching. I will see you all next time. Bye everyone.